welcome to the DASA, welcome to the DASA community. And today we're going to be providing a members series talking about how to accelerate the DevOps journey by learning from others. And we're going to be talking about learning culture in this series. And, you know, successfully shaping an organization's learning and knowledge sharing culture is a central part of success when you're trying to apply principles and ideas in an organization to make changes happen. So we'll be talking about various as aspects, developing a learning culture and how to learn from others. And I'm going to introduce the speakers in a moment. I'm just going to give a few moments to talk about DASA Association. My name is Katrina Logie and I'm your host today and I will be steering the questions. So we're going to, you know, this is a one hour long webinar. We please do, if you have any questions, um, we do welcome those from the audience as we go along and we like to make it as interactive as possible. So about DASA, DASA is the world's largest DevOps and Agile association, fostering dialogue, debate, and collaboration amongst leading industry professionals and organizations. With a network of 300 plus partner organizations, DASA helps define, inform, and advance the DevOps industry through networking, information sharing, awards, lifelong learning, and certification. It was founded in 2016 with over 300 plus partners in 48 countries with over 10,000 professionals. So this spotlight series is to highlight industry bodies and community platforms such as DASA to offer guidance and advice based on co-creation and shared experiences. And for every challenge you may have, other organizations and leaders have faced these and other challenges in their transformations and have come up with effective approaches and solutions. So we want to invite you to join the DASA community as we discuss complex but relevant topics and so we can tap into the collective intelligence and experiences of others from around the globe and exchange ideas and practical guidance. And today on the webinar, we have Matthew David, who is DevOps Director at Accenture. Welcome, Matthew. Great to be here, Katrina. And Dimitri Vanderbroek, who is founding member of DevOps Agile Skills. Welcome, Dimitri. Pleasure being here, Katrina. So let's go into the questions and let's start with, you know, we're talking about how do we learn from others? And, you know, when we're on our DevOps journey, what is a, you know, let's start with what is a learning organization? Matthew, do you want to? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. <laughs> so it's a great question to start with. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Katrina and Dimitri for inviting me to come and speak today. Uh, I think the work that you guys are doing is absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, being a DevOps director, I believe that uh, uh, there is a, uh, a, a good drive for companies to learn more about DevOps and implement it within their organizations. Um, and, and Matt, think, maybe tell us more yeah, do you want, about... Do you want, just a tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so um, I, I have I've been very fortunate with my entire career uh, to have placed myself in a position where I've been involved with uh, leading technologies, um, and leading technologies requires uh, two key um, elements. One is a constant understanding and review of the market and how uh, people are responding to different ways of delivering solutions. And that typically comes down to faster, better, um, with greater success to the customer. Um, and the second is having uh, teams that uh, will adapt quickly to those changes and transformations within the market. Uh, so I, I was lucky enough um, in, early, in the early 2000s to uh, uh, understand the value of Agile and breaking down large projects from being uh, 12, 18 month uh, slots to uh, two week iterations. And then about uh, six, seven years ago, um, I, I made a pivot uh, to uh, DevOps um, and just the understanding of having my teams uh, leverage uh, the, the, the value of 
continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, and that has brought me um, uh, to where I am today, where um, I lead up uh, DevOps work uh, for uh, some uh, teams within Accenture. I, I'm very fortunate that I get to speak with a, a lot of clients about the value of DevOps and uh, and the kind of complementary technologies around that and how we evolve and move forward. Great, great. Well, we're, we're very happy to have you today with your experience. And Dimitri, actually, do you want to just talk, talk a little bit about you as well before we dive into this question? Question. Yeah, it's a pleasure, and uh, again, pleasure being here with you. Um, quick introduction. So I was part of the um, part of the Daza family for quite some time. Actually, one of the founding members back in uh, 2015, 2016. In the early years, I had the big pleasure to organize Daza Devil meetups around the world to talk about our body of knowledge. Um, uh, discuss various instruments that, that we brought to the market. I was also the managing director for uh, for a little bit more than a year until the end of uh, 2020. After that, I started focusing on the membership programs. Uh, I think, yeah, the very interesting uh, model for enterprises and service providers who work closely with us. And I combine that role at the moment with a, a leadership role at a um, virtual reality software company. So uh, been with Data for quite some time. Very excited about talking about with Matt about this um, you know, learning culture and getting uh, his experience because that's what this is uh, all about. You know, learning from each other and um, yeah, discussing ways forward and how we can always improve things. Okay, Back great. To- Thank you, Dimitri. So, you know, yeah, we're talking about learning and cult- learning culture. What it, What is a learning organization? Let's go back to this. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a really quite a good question. And I think that I, I want to take a step back from that question for what drives the need for having a learning culture um, and then step into how we address a learning culture. Um, and the, the driver that is uh, constantly pushing for a learning culture uh, is the customer. Um, And the customer can have many different faces. It can be uh, somebody that's physically buying your product on an online store. It could be a a strategic partner that uh, is helping you with your supply chain. Uh, It could be people within your organization. But the customer is what is driving that learning culture today. Um, And the acceleration that we have seen in how customer behaviors have changed in the last three years um, is really a tipping point for where we are today. So if we look at the customers, the person that's driving um, the the change, uh, then what we need to do on the flip side is as uh, people who are here to delight the customer, uh, we have to look at why have those behaviors changed and what can we do to address those change the changes and to be constantly moving in that forward direction you have to have an organization that is constantly challenging itself with the fundamental question of are we doing what we're doing in the best way possible today and let's assume we're not what can we do to change that so we can constantly be improving um, do not get caught with uh, in the, the rut of uh, you know we've been doing this solution this way for 20, 30 years, and it's good enough um, because the customer has the choices and the ability to move, and they will move quickly, um, as we have seen in the last three years because of the pandemic, uh, issues with supply chains, and now uh, with a war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Dimitri, what are your thoughts um, on that? Yeah, first of all, thanks, Katrina, for starting with probably one of the most difficult questions in um, in one go. Yeah, I appreciate the um, uh, the customer perspective because, I mean, uh, uh, without obsessive focus on your customers, I think enterprises, you know, they are doomed to fail. I mean, or internal departments who work for internal customers. So, so but you also touch on uh, Ukraine, uh, but I also, I mean, would like to, talk about job market numbers also in US. I think there are, of course, multiple dimensions or mega trends. 
that are yeah. also playing into the to the need because I mean I like to talk about what 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 is driving this the need for for a learning culture. I mean it's become so incredibly difficult to attract talent that I think one of the answers uh, potential answers could be having a proper strong yeah learning culture as well. So I think. Then the need, I mean, I think I see multiple drivers there uh, pushing the need for um, a strong learning organization or, or, or learning culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dimitri, you bring up some really good points there. Um, so let's look at some of the key mega trends that are happening right now um, in the market. Uh, we have a, a really unusual um, jobs market, um, particularly here in North America, where there are more jobs and people to fill those, um, those roles. Um, and, and it's across the entire market spectrum. It's not just a specific uh, industry. It's, it's across the entire industry, um, but really hurting within tech. Um, the second is uh, the global economy um, has been um, significantly impacted um, by uh, uh, oil prices, which are really coming um, uh, as a reflection of what's happening with uh, the war with, uh, in Ukraine from, from Russia. Um, we have supply chain issues that we've been wrestling with for two years now that frankly are just not going away. Um, and that those supply chain issues are acerbated by the jobs market. Um, yeah. And then uh, finally, um, you know, we, we, we talk, I was actually, we were talking before this about uh, Boris Johnson's resignation speech and how, how he was mentioning that uh, we're out of the pandemic. And we were not, we're, here's the, the reality is we're not. Um, and uh, so, uh, we have these uh, mega trends that are impacting us. Um, I think what's interesting, though, is that there are additional mega trends on top of that uh, that are driving uh, innovation forward. Um, and, and if I was to look into my crystal ball and say, okay, what were the, the mega trends that are going to happen over the next two years? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that AI and data. Um, are critical elements uh, within those two mega trends, um, and what that uh, the reason why I see that is um, uh, one of my groups that I partner with very closely is on AI, and that's really uh, when you look at DevOps, DevOps and AI uh, work so closely with each other. If you can start automating your processes using uh, AI um, uh, within your environment, uh, you're, you're really helping. Uh, reduce costs and downtime within your uh, solutions. But if I was to look at AI, uh, the advances that have happened in, say, the last five years um, have been absolutely tremendous. I mean, really, just even the last two years have been absolutely tremendous. And if I look at the momentum that's happening in, in that advancement, the advances that are going to continue ex um, uh, accelerating over the next two years, we will see more advances in the next 24 months for AI than we have in the history of AI up to this point. So uh, and the history goes back into the 1950s. So we're, we're looking at 60, uh, 70 years of uh, innovation is going to happen in the next 24 months. Um, and so it's critical uh, from a, uh, an education point of view that um, you're constantly aware of what the opportunity and the value that is being exposed that you can take quick advantage of and bring into your organizations. And again, it comes back to the, how can I improve what I'm doing today? Even if it's just a small amount, but those small amounts really add up fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in a DevOps context, Matt, you're talking about AI. I mean, can you sort of, you know, explain how, you know, because the, the thing is pe people think with AI, they think they can install it and it can run by itself. Yeah. But, yeah. but actually, can you <laughs> yeah, I've, so, so how do you sort of bring this into context with DevOps and, and, and manage that? How do you sort of make yeah. them understand it? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. So uh, a couple of ways to answer that. So uh, within DevOps, we have, um, there's, we have a, a discipline called AI ops, uh, which is how do we use AI in the operations of our um, environments. And so uh, particularly when it comes to cloud technologies, you, you see a lot of discussions around containers, Kubernetes, um, uh, leveraging a, a lot of uh, you know, very seasoned uh, open source solutions to help manage your environment. Um, but uh, AI and AI ops are, are, are not the same thing. AI is really this umbrella term uh, that we use 
for all things automated. And they start from the very far end with uh, RPA, which I, I see as dumb AI. It's just repeating a process over and over again, so ro 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 robotic process automation, where you're coming in and you're moving data from one Excel spreadsheet into a database or something like that. And it's a repetitive task. Um, and then you have all the different variations of AI right over to the, the, the far end where you have machine learning, where you're doing some very, very intelligent calculations and uh, you know, you're doing the, the deep fakes and things like that. And the way I see um, uh, AI uh, impacting DevOps is really about being becoming an assistant to the engineer as they're developing their solutions. Um, and this really ties into uh, DevSecOps and, and constantly improving the quality um, uh, of the solution that you're delivering in your pipelines as they push through the pipeline. So you're using AI to help test, you're using AI uh, to help ensure that the production environment is running, and then you're leveraging AI that, um, so uh, you know the, the, the holy grail is if uh, something in production fails, that the AI detects it and is able to then either make some change or cancel out that uh, operation and replace it with an operation that does work. Um, and AI simply can work at speed. Now, that, that's, that's the, the, the story you tell and the benefit, there's immediate costs and um, uh, justifications there. But here's the reality, um, is that um, AI is, we're not at this point with AI where we have a, a, a general uh, artificial intelligence, which would be human-like uh, intelligence. We're, we're really we're, we're many, many years away from that. Yeah. Um, so we have to observe and have people who are trained and manage the AI programs and consider them to be virtual employees within your organization. Yes, those may be employees at, what, 24 hours a day, um, but um, as the organization and the processes change, you need to be able to have the people who are trained on the AI to be able to apply those changes. So take advantage of AI to help improve and speed up uh, your delivery of solutions, but then also have people who are equally trained on managing the AI. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is, so is this learning culture, I mean, is this, you know, obviously this this is where we come in and we need to implement a learning culture. So yeah. is this happening right now? Is this, you know, you know people sort of it building? Is. And, and, you know, what? why is it, you know, it's, what you know how is that exactly how are they sort of implementing this learning culture so so it's a really good question so i think what we have to look at with um there's there's um three ways to look at it one is the tools second is the processes and the third is the people um mm -hmm. and and the reality is is that it always goes people process tools um but uh, let's start in reverse order and do it wrong for once um the tools that we need to have for uh, establishing a, a DevOps culture um, that is part of this learning culture, um, the tools are there um, and they're, they're solid. They've been around for, for many, many years. Uh, some of them are going back 10 or 15 years. So the, the tools are there. The processes, the best practices uh, for implementing uh, the next level of solution delivery, they're there. Um, you know, there are many companies, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, of Microsoft, of Amazon, of uh, IBM that have very detailed playbooks on what are the best ways to deliver a solution. But then we come into really the, the most important part, which is the people. Um, and the reality is, is, is as people, we can't be in a constant flux of change immediately. We have to build up to change. Um, and uh, for many companies, we have been delivering solutions uh, using uh, what we call waterfall as a, a, a long extended uh, uh, project management way of delivering a solution where uh, people will, will build the app uh, or they'll, they'll put together the, the business justification for the app, they'll, they'll capture the requirements, they'll do the work, and then the work will be tested. Um, you know, so, so moving from that process to an agile process is really the first step um, in ad ad adapting to a culture that addresses the need of the customer. But to make that step, you have to understand 
why you are uh, moving to a faster delivery model that has higher quality. And that requires having an organization that wants to learn um, about improving uh, the way that they're delivering. And typically what I have found is that as companies make a transition from a uh, traditional way of delivering to a uh, modern way of delivering, uh, it can take three to five years and it starts off slowly. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're crawling and we're, we're learning how to crawl. But at some point we do start to walk and then we start to walk fast and then we start to run. And that's what you want to be able to do is you want to start increasing momentum so that as people move from one stage of uh, delivery to another stage, uh, you're not keeping the momentum at the same speed. Uh, you're constantly challenging your teams to, to move faster. And by challenging them to move faster, it's, in, it's challenging them to become more efficient at how they educate themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how, I mean, how, we're talking about, you know, moving faster and, and changes in, you know, how they sort of how they learn it, it, does this require specific roles in in organizations i mean you've managed teams matt for example yeah. so yeah um and customers yeah, and customers, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean I, I think dimitri to your point customers are really the the the, the fundamental uh, person that we're uh, beating our drum to um and uh what i uh, again what i found like through my own experience um is that um, a, a lot of times uh, an organization, there's really two parts that you need for uh, continuous education um, to happen within an organization. First of all, there has to be a mandate and one that is stuck to by an executive leader, um, preferably the CEO. Um, and this is not an IT thing. This is not just a technology thing. As we look at um, uh, constant uh, education, it is a company-wide thing uh, because uh, it's, uh, the customer demands are impacting everybody within the organization. So preferably mm -hmm. you want the CEO to do a mandate and, and then to stick to that mandate and constantly talk about that mandate or being able to deliver faster and better. Uh, then within... The organization itself, you want to be able to provide the uh, opportunities uh, for uh, people to be able to be successful at delivering um, in a new way. And I have found consistently that uh, starting with a really big project is not the, uh, a good way to start with success. You want to start with small projects, with small teams, so that they immediately get that rush of, we did something in you know in a two week period, um, and um, and so that's that's the first step. And then mm -hmm. um, you know you want to be constantly working with your within your organization, constantly talking to your team, have a governance group that is aware of what the organization is doing, where pulling in um, best um, um, practices from outside your organization to measure yourself against, and then um, at some point. Uh, you are going to have to make a change in the way that your organization um, is structured. Um, because if you are an organization that is in the same structure that it has been for, say, 30, 40 years, and, and there's a lot of companies that are still in that, um, that structure, um, moving at speed uh, and, and, and giving the opportunity for your teams to uh, educate themselves, they're going to learn very quickly that the way that their company is structured uh, isn't going to enable them to move that uh, the optimum uh, forward direction. Mm -hmm. And that's when you make the step of how do you set up uh, pods of teams that are self-dependent, that are mm -hmm. becomes them really themselves small uh, companies within the company that have the control and structure to be able to uh, move forward and uh, deliver on what the, the customer wants and move at their speed. Mm -hmm. Dimitri, what are, what are your thoughts? Yes, interesting um, uh, thought, and I mean, just thinking about it, I mean, the role of the CEO, top leadership, building this culture, learning culture, making learning strategic, of course, that's where it starts. I'm also interested, I mean, as Katrina also uh, addressed, I mean, so, so what are the change agents or what are the specific roles you can identify in enterprises and organizations to 
sustain, to, to learn, to train. Um, people getting into that mindset. I mean, I can share, I mean, at Daza we have a specific philosophy also in the DevOps coaches. They play a very important role there as kind of bodies to the team members in, in these transformation processes. But I'm also interested to hear from you. Do you identify specific roles or positions or change agents who mm-hmm. support the organization on this uh, continual process as, as, as well? Because it's just not a one-time effort. It needs to be sustained. Absolutely. It, it, you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's not just a one-time effort. It is a, a, a continuous process. Um, uh, you know, to use an overused expression, it is the journey. It is a journey. It is not a destination. Um, there is no destination. Um, it, you can look back, um, and a famous example of this is uh, with Jeff Bezos uh, when he was CEO of Amazon. Uh, in his first letter to his shareholders, he referred to day one um, and how the company would be operating and that uh, they would always work in a mindset of today is the critical day, that today is day one of when we're starting, and every day should be treated like that. Um, That just fosters a a sense of urgency um, to be able to move forward. Um, We have found, and uh, so um, one of the biggest challenges is is moving an organization from a hierarchical um, organization, which... We all like, we all want to be the leader um, into a matrix organization. And uh, the, the, uh, the company I work for, Accenture, uh, we have 700,000 employees worldwide. And we're a matrix organization. Um, and uh, we do have a, a leadership team. It's a very small team. Um, and the rest of the organization is uh, matrix based. And <clears throat> we pull in people and skills as needed. Uh, but it's very difficult to move from a hierarchical to a matrix. Um, but fundamentally, that's one of the steps you want to be able to take. Um, and one of the uh, the tools that we use um, is Scaled Agile. And uh, there's a Scaled Agile framework. It's an open source framework. And you can Google it. And it's um, uh, an organization. And it's essentially looking at the over the last 10 years, there's been kind of a, a plethora of uh, accelerators um, that are be, have been used by um, different teams. There's you know Lean Agile. There's um, uh, uh, just uh, there's Agile. There's Scrum. There's just different ways of being able to deliver. Um, and uh, the uh, Scaled Agile framework is a way that we have found that it brings the best of these ideas together. Um, and uh, what we've implemented with a number of our clients now is just a, a model of pods where uh, you have individual teams and they're working on a element of the solution. They, they are complete product owners of that solution. Um, some solutions require several pods working together, and in which case we'll have then an expert that will float between the pods so that there's consistency between them. But mm-hmm. we have found that to be really successful yeah. And that um, the focus moves from the hierarchy, which is self-serving for the business, to one where it's self-serving to the customer needs. Mm-hmm. And, and Matt, we have a question from uh, from thank, from Martin Martin Gross, um, and it's an interesting one. So uh, he says, in my humble opinion, giving people the freedom to experiment is very important. Can you reflect on that? On that kind of. Mm-hmm cultural element and the relationship to connection with learning and learning culture. So the experimentation and building that learning culture. What is your perspective? Yes. I, I completely agree with that. Experimentation is um, a key element um, of learning. And uh, I think that uh, experimentation and what is seen as risk um, kind of come hand in hand and yep. uh, Unfortunately, we, we, we are kind of we are conditioned not to take risks. You know, we, we want to take the safe path, and um, through experimentation is the only way in which you can try something um, that is potentially a risk um, that may not work. And uh, what we have to look at is we need to create a culture where it is okay to take risks, uh, because uh, fundamentally, whether something works or not. 
just going through the process of experimenting with um, uh, something. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, uh, out of the box here. So uh, we um, let's assume that we have a DevOps team. They're working great. And we want to bring in a new tool to help with um, our testing. Well, let's try it. Mm -hmm. Let's just let's run an experiment. Let's see if that mm -hmm. tool works. And let's see what we can learn. Uh, we might see something that you know we haven't applied to our previous tool, or you know, let's go through that experimentation. Or maybe mm -hmm. a, a customer needs a new solution. And and the reality is that it, for me, experimentation is always success. Um, and um, I saw uh, so I'm a huge advocate of SpaceX. I, I love where we are in the space industry today. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. There's lots of rockets going up, and mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, areas of focus right now with uh, SpaceX is that they are getting ready to launch uh, the world's largest rocket ever uh, ever produced. And uh, Elon Musk said that uh, success is one of the factors that may happen that will be a benefit to us, um, mm -hmm. implying that uh, anything that happens with the launch of the rocket will always will be seen as a success, whether it explodes mm -hmm. up on the launch pad, um, it, you know, they're testing it right now, um, or whether it actually successfully takes off. And having that kind of um, um, a leadership from the CEO down is critical. Um, when you're in an organization that is, no, no, we have to do it perfect every single time, the reality is that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you're only going to go down the very safest, safest path. And you're going to lose opportunities to uh, potentially open up uh, gates to um, delight your customers. And can we brainstorm also for, for our audience? And by the way, thanks that, I mean, more and more people coming online is also um, saying hello left and right. But 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 can we brainstorm also, I mean, on a practical way, like how can we incentivize or build, as Martin said, this, if we consider it important, this experiment, this culture of experimentation, I mean, and taking, you know, I mean, specific risks, um, um, uh, being as if, how can you as a manager, team leader, top manager, or, or how can we, what can we do? What can you do on the ground to, to enable this kind of culture, because it's easy to say, yeah, of course, we should be taking risk and then yeah. we should not blame each other if things go wrong. What can we do on the ground? What what are, can you give some examples? So um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, um, uh, one in particular, uh, so um, uh, this was a few years ago, I was uh, working for a products company and um, I had uh, one guy in my team really, really sharp and um, he came to me, he said, you know, Matt, there's, um, and uh, our, our team, we were focused on building mobile solutions. And, uh, mm -hmm. so his mindset was always on mobility and, you know, the, the latest thing that's happening in mobility. I said, you know, Matt, um, I, th I think we could, um, you know, we have these end caps that go in grocery stores, um, that, um, uh, allow us to, you know, promote our products. But the reality is we, we make tens of thousands of these every year. Um, and we have no understanding of whether or not they really work. Um, we just kind of assume because we've been doing them for 60 years that they do mm -hmm. work. Um, and he says, I, I think we can use some of the technologies that we've been using in our mobile team uh, to better understand the customer. And so um, I said, okay, I, I love this idea. Um, at the time we were under a crunch to get something delivered. I said, okay, you know the work we have to get delivered. Um, do you have some time around that in which you can work on this? <clears throat> and he said, you know what? I think I can get a prototype. It's going to look pretty basic, but I think I can get a prototype up and running in two weeks um, and still uh, hit uh, the, the work that we need to have delivered. All right, go for it, mm -hmm. go for it. And he had my full support on that. And he delivered a great solution. The reason why he was able to deliver that solution, though, um, is that uh, for two things. One is I was supporting him and he knew that I was supporting him uh, because I had uh, gone to the team previously and uh, given them opportunities to try things differently. Um, but uh, he also knew that it was a natural pivot from the work that he was doing at that point in time. He was working with mobile tools, uh, so he already knew how the hardware worked and he knew how the software worked. 
and he just wanted to apply it to a slightly different medium, in which case we, uh, we took a Raspberry Pi and we wired up an end cap and put cameras on it, and, and, and it, was, it was a fun little experiment. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you need to be able to create an environment where when the opportunity for an idea comes to your team, that they feel comfortable coming to you as the leader and saying, I've got this crazy idea, do you support it? And you absolutely have to always support it. Now, the, the caveat I'll add to that is you also have to deliver on the work. Um, and so I typically will, um, I have a flexing time of, you know, of you know, really about a, um, eight to 10 hours per week that I give my teams to flex on um, to allow them to work on uh, kind of side work, side projects. And sometimes it's really small things and sometimes it's really big things. Sometimes it's something that's completely different uh, to the work that they're doing. Um, and the idea is that um, education has changed. No, we're no longer just going into a classroom and learning. Education has completely changed. And I want my teams to always have that opportunity where they're going back in and they're constantly educating themselves. Even if it's you know they spent two hours um, and a week and this one week uh, experimenting with a, a new AI program to help with their pipelines, you know those those all count for that that mindset change that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's giving them the time and also the tools to go off yes. and do some and and self learn basically. Yes, mm -hmm. and the support. I mean, uh, you know, the, the reality is uh, we, we all need leaders and we need leaders that go um and, and we have we need leaders that are not bosses we need leaders that are coaches um and there's a fundamental difference um as as a boss i'm dictating what needs to get done and, and i've had a lot of bosses in my career i know exactly what they're like it's you know they have a list of tasks and they want to go through every single thing and they're only happy when all those tasks are done and you can get it done in one day great it takes you two weeks they're going to be having a conversation with you. um yeah. As a, as a coach, I assume that you know, you're an adult and, and I hired you because I thought you were smart. Um, I assume you're going to get the tasks done. Um, we, we, we have that as a basic mandate. You're going to get your tasks done. Let's not talk about it. Um, what I'm looking for um, as, as a, uh, for coaches is I'm looking for uh, people that see the opportunity in their teams and give them the tap on the shoulder and say, hey, have you thought about and then providing them an opportunity to think differently um, and giving them that feedback and the, the comfort and the framework that allows them to know uh, that they can educate themselves, that they can experiment, that as long as they're not doing anything that's illegal or against uh, the, uh, the uh, company uh, guidelines, then I want them to try and stretch their knowledge. Okay. We actually have a, a question here about building teams as a continuous journey to reach to an idle DevOps or DevSecOps team. Are there any tips for keeping the team stable in spite of people leaving and joining at the same time? Um, so so there, there, is, there is no idle, uh, ideal um, team. Um, and, and, and frankly, um, the, 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 the challenge of people leaving your teams is, it's a real problem. And um, I talk to a lot of leaders um, um, uh, from other, I've got, actually I was just talking to a friend of mine and um, uh, she is a, a director for e-commerce for, um, uh, for uh, a company on the East Coast. And uh, she was just saying that she had brought in um, a, a new person to join her team uh, typically, when she uh, would advertise for a role, she would get you know, 10, 15, 20 people responding. Uh, she had one person respond. Uh, it turned out it was the intern on their team. And uh, uh, when, it, uh, when they went to make the, 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 uh, the job offer, the intern and I said, this is really great. I, I love working here and everything. Um, and, but then the, the dreaded but came, which is, but I already have two other uh, offers. Um, are you willing to match them? And, you know, so there is a very significant dynamic change um, in, our, um, our, in our teams. So here's, here's something we need to recognize. One is um, we've never been in an opportunity 
whereas uh, individual uh, contributors uh, where you are in charge of your uh, career uh, development um, and your career destination. Um, and there's lots of things that we all take in consideration, but money, unfortunately, is a big part of that. It's, it allows us to change our lifestyle. And so what I'm seeing is I have to do three things to be able to uh, ensure that my teams want to stay together. One is I need to recognize that the opportunity for them to leave um, simply for money um, is going to happen. Um, and, um, you know, what do I do to address that? Um, how can I reward them? Um, but at the same time, I'm also working within a budget. Um, I can't just hand out uh, gold coins. I would love to be able to do that. So, you know, I have to work with, with, with what I've got. And so I then move into the second area is am I creating a safe uh, environment for my teams to to feel that they are getting a number of key um, uh, career um, uh, um, uh, drivers? Are they Do they see clear uh, career growth for the, themselves personally? Do they understand the value of the work that they are delivering against? And do they see the opportunity uh, to be able to contribute to the practice and become a, um, a leader within our organization? Um, and to me, um, I know for myself personally um, that uh, those are very, very critical for me. You know, I, I, the people I work with, I need to know that I can trust them. Um, not necessarily like them, but trust them um, that um, when we are working together, that we're all in. Um, and that is very exciting because people want to be together with other uh, passionate and intelligent people. And then the third is what is the direction that the, the company is taking? What is the focus? What And is that focus being um, very clearly um, articulated to the organization? Um, do we understand what the goals of the company are or are we just kind of muddling through it if you can get that what what you'll find is that the second two key criteria of what is it you know what is in it for me uh, for growth personally and second of all uh, what is in it for seeing that the company will grow you'll often find that that um, primary driver for somebody wanting to change a financial uh, driver um, isn't as big a deal as a lot of people think. Right. Yeah, because a lot of people have their own goals. But it's very important yes. to have an overarching goal and that the team are working towards that and they yeah. understand yes. what those goals are. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the way that um, I, I work with my teams is I, I look at uh, two things. I'm, I, I'm always looking at what is the big picture that we're looking to be at um, you know, five, ten years from now. Uh, understanding that the whole world is going to change and, you know, there's, you know, where do we, what, what would be, they be that vision that we want to go to in the future? But then um, pulling it back, what do we need to now do in the next 90 days to get us towards that vision? Um, and the reason why I do that kind of long, short range uh, approach is that most of us can see um, within the next 90 days. Right, for instance, right now, the next 90 days, um, I've got um, over the next month, I've got uh, my end of year assessments for uh, my, my fiscal year for the company I work for uh, ends at the end of August. So I know that I've got to do end of year reviews in July. Um, in uh, August, I'm taking a summer vacation and going to be hanging out with my brother and his family. Um, and then in September, um, our new financial year starts. And so we need to hit uh, the ground running with our best foot uh, to be able to meet our financial goals for the next year. I can see that happening. A year from now, I can't see what's happening a year from now. I mean, <laughs> we, we may not be here a year from now. Uh, yeah. um, so, yeah. But I can see that five years from now, a big goal is I want to be able to be in a company that is twice the size um, or twice the value that it is today. And so I work on the short term to be able to hit the long term. Okay. So and how do you I do with my entire teams? Right. How do you get your teams? I mean, there's a question here. How do you, you know how to how do you get your teams to effectively sort of work together and also improve collaboration and, and communication? And what, so what are the pitfalls? The, yeah. So there's three types of personality 
that I typically come across. Um, uh, there are the, the drivers who have been doing the work um, that I'm looking for a while. And so if I look at, at DevOps as a frame of reference um, and I want to implement a DevOps uh, team uh, within a client that hasn't done, it, um, done DevOps before, I will want to bring in those experts. And those experts are setting the, the tone and the pace what it means to be a uh, an excellent DevOps team. They help uh, accelerate um, uh, building out the environments and the pipelines. But then the second personality I'm looking for is um, the person who doesn't have the experience um, that I'm looking for, but has the passion um, and a really exceptional passion uh, to be able to uh, deliver the work. And so I will partner them, pair them with the knowledgeable leader so that they can do a two-in-a-box uh, approach for knowledge sharing, that they are working hand-in-hand hand and that they are moving forward and learning. Um, and the new person who is eventually going to take over that role is learning by doing. And I think that learning by doing is a very effective uh, education uh, model. Um, and then you have the third uh, uh, group, and those are the, the people where you have to win them over. And um, and the reality is the majority of people will be won over, uh, but you need the knowledge person and then the passionate leader within your, uh, the organization who's willing to learn to be the driving forces to win over the rest of the group. Uh, unfortunately, there, um, there always are going to be one or two people who just do not want to change. Um, and the reality is we have a market today that, you know, if they need to move to another company or another place within the organization, they have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, Dimitri, from, you know, Dasa's point of view, how do we sort of help DevOps yeah. teams, you know, be collaborative yeah. and There was an interesting in question that, that Matt also responded to. From, I think it was an anonymous LinkedIn user was, about... Yeah. What do you do if someone leaves the team? You know, how do you um, create a stable environment? And for those who are familiar with the uh, DASA instruments, we have also our team competence framework, which also helps you, uh, by the way, for those who recognize it's the, I mean, it's across 12 different dimensions. You determine team competences, skills and competences. You identify the individual person and it gives a, pretty strong handle identifying where you are strong or at the right level as a team. And by knowing the individual DevOps profiles of your members, organizations use that to yeah, basically yeah, determine and assemble very powerful teams. It's one of the instruments that are out there and I completely agree with Matt's approach as well. It's about also uh, culture, uh, similar kind of language, you know, shared vision on first 90 days etc so for those interested in me it's a it's a free of charge tool it's on the DASA website just check it out and see if it's useful uh, to for on the individual and enterprise level another thing which i think is very interesting in in the the DASA context is what matt said about um coaches and leaders what i heard you saying is a kind of every leader should be a kind of coach or having specific uh, coaching skills as well to, to help individuals and their team members go through the transformation or, or come into a kind of continuous education mode. And, uh, and I would like to understand, I mean, if from your experience, uh, are you training your leaders or the lead is at your customer base in those coaching skills, or how do you identify them? What kind of models are you are you using to 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 train those critical skills? And from that perspective, we completely support that philosophy. Yeah, I, 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 Dimitri, you bring up a, a fantastic uh, point there. Um, um, as as we mature through our careers, we, we do move from different roles and we gain more uh, responsibility and we, our goal is to aim up uh, into a leadership role. And uh, one of the things that we do uh, very effectively is, and I talk about this when I have employees uh, join, is that 
uh, you need it's it's critical that you own your career. Um, but second of all, uh, to work for a company that gives you the tools so that you constantly are aware that if you are in a an analyst role, how do I get to a consulting role or a manager role? How do I, you know, what is the gap between where I am today to where I need to be? And what do I need to do to be able to demonstrate that I'm ready to be uh, promoted to that next level? And so that's something that we do internally um, and we take very seriously. We have a number of programs, uh, each person, uh, all the way up to our CEO, um, Julie Sweet. Every single person has an advisor, a career advisor, including Julie Sweet. Uh, mm -hmm. She has uh, her own, uh, and she's the CEO of a $200 billion company. Um, and she has her own career advisor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's one thing. The second is we take uh, uh, it very, uh, we focus on mentoring and we have mentoring programs. Um, but those mentoring programs only last 90 days. And so it is about targeting a specific um, uh, area, uh, it may be a skill set, it may be uh, an interaction. It's, you know, it's whatever you see as important for your uh, journey, your career development, but targeting just that one specific area and, and changing um, how you're working in that area over a 90-day period. Mm -hmm. But then we bring that into um, our clients. And uh, I was actually just talking to, uh, a client the other day, they are uh, they, they don't under, they don't really fully understand the value of of cloud for data, and mm -hmm. so I said, well, you know, we actually have an executive program. It's a half day program um, where we actually um, will show you how to actually build uh, solutions um, for AI using data in the cloud uh, as an executive. You don't, you don't do any programming, uh, but just using the tools that are available. And I think that constant um, ability to be able to share uh, that uh, there are tools that leaders can take advantage of. Because once you become a leader, you don't magically stop learning. I think actually that's, that's just the beginning of your learning career. Um, yeah. Ooh, be careful. <laughs> I feel like Madonna in a concert where my headpiece is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think it's very important to be able to um, provide those paths uh, for uh, education mm -hmm. uh, always and continuously, no matter where you are within your leadership journey. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's just it's just out of interest. It just, I mean, um, comes up. I mean, do you have instruments to measure if your clients are on the right track, um, developing a learning yeah. culture? I mean, how? Yeah, where do you start, and what kind of dimensions? Would you measure? I mean, it's a very interesting one for me. Yeah, so that's that's really good, and and, and typically uh, that there's there's uh, two levels um, of measurement. There is uh, the skills that you need to have mm -hmm. as a leader. So um, you know, every every leader is responsible for uh, a, a group of people that are doing something, and mm -hmm. if you were to go to that leader and say, okay. Um, what if, if you know? Put on your hat and um, look into the future. Uh, Thirty-six months. What skills do you need uh, within your organization, and what would your organization structure look like if you have those skills? Um, and so that's that's uh, one element we do. And um, and typically uh, we uh, we have each leader. Uh, we'll go through. Um, <clears throat> we'll have two elements to that. One is the org structure, and the second is the skill set. And then the skill set really is range of one to five. Uh, five being uh, that person with that the skill set is absolutely world class. They're they're presenting uh, constantly at conferences because they're just seen as the best in that space. To uh, three is. Um, they are exceptional and they are the person within the company that has that knowledge to one being they have some understanding of the technology, um, but that's all they need. Um, and so that's one thing we do is, you know, org structure and skills needed to uh, mm -hmm. support that org structure in the future. And then you step back and go, okay, what does your organization look like today? And can you map those skills to people within your company? And what you want to be able to do then is, um, provide a path where you can map people within your organization today to where uh, your future organization will be, and then also provide them a, a, a career path uh, for skill learning to get from where they are to where they need to be in the future uh, with clear milestone metrics that will 
then be put in place to say, mm-hmm. are you moving in the right direction? Um, and then, of course, you know, if you do a 36-month uh, uh, rollout, 18, 24 months later, you're going to do the next 36 months. And so it just becomes then a constant way of growing your organization. Mm-hmm. And making sure that they keep learning. And yeah. As Martin also said, again, it's also you know good to provide a self-assessment for teams to identify where they oh, you know, want, want to improve. Yes, yes. Um, uh, yes, um, self-assessment is really good. Um, and, and one of the, the uh, so I think self-assessment is really good. And one of the opportunities you have as a coach is moving from being uh, self-assessment from being something where people will see themselves as being critical on the work that they've done to self-assessment going, I've learned stuff, but this is how it um, puts me in a good place to do the work I need to do in the future. Um, and I think that's a critical pivot that as a leader, you need to be able to uh, change the, 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 the approach of self-assessment to being one which is a forward-looking skill development process. Okay. So it's providing them with an individual career path. Yes, yeah, it's absolutely critical. There's there's no universal career paths anymore. Okay, and you also talked about the power of pipelines. Can we talk a little bit mm-hmm. about that? And then we've only got five minutes, by the way, or four minutes. So we're, <laughs> short. We're, we're short on time, but let's just talk about the power of pipelines just very quickly and bringing you know DevSecOps and and cloud into that. Sure, sure. So just just quickly, uh, uh, pipelines are the the magic of what makes. DevOps work. So what we're looking to do is automating our processes as much as pop as possible. So as a developer, uh, you're able to uh, develop some code and then push it through our, your pipeline and have it uh, tested and then eventually move to our production. Um, the, the, that, the, the opportunity we have with pipelines is that we can start inserting additional tools um, that are uh, quote unquote manual processes or processes that are not fully automated uh, today. And security is an, one of those key areas. Uh, we hear the term DevSecOps, which is how do we move uh, security left into our automated pipeline process? Um, and that's about how do we take our security tools that uh, validate and assess uh, code that's being developed and do it automatically. So it's part of our pipeline process. Um, and uh, to your, your second point around cloud, uh, Katrina, uh, why that's important is um, a lot of these tools are being deployed in the cloud. And cloud gives you a way to scale that we just have not seen uh, in our careers. I've been uh, in IT for, gosh, um, almost 30 years now. And there was always um, been uh, a, a new technology platform that's come along, but then a cost associated with it. Uh, with the uh, cloud, it is the first time where, uh, because you are charged for what you use, um, and often as a developer, you can get uh, free access to a, a lot of uh, services, you can actually get in and start building solutions without paying anything or paying very, very little. We're talking pennies on the dollar. Um, so uh, there's an opportunity to take advantage of tools as they come out. I mean, Dimitri, what, what are your thoughts around the, the, the power of pipeline? Yeah, so in this in the light of this discussion, I would think, well, it's more than the pipelines and CI C D. In the end, it's the organization, it's the team of individuals who make a su- company successful or not. Of course, there is the automation part, the technology part, the enablement part. But I mean, looking f- from a talent or learning perspective perspective. I think it's all about people. I mean, uh, look at the Agile Manifesto. We talked about it. I mean, it's people over process. It's people first. I mean, and that's the essence also what you shared with us uh, today, Matt, and uh, and the importance of organizations creating that essence and that, that mindset that learning is strategic. Um and by the way, maybe it's true because I'm not a real expert in those pipelines and CSCD like you are. But, but, but from that perspective, um, yeah. Today's focus is on the, the human element, you know. It, it is, and, and, and you're absolutely spot on with that, Dimitri. I mean, the, um, it is fundamentally 
Um, businesses are run by people. And uh, the, the tools and the way that we uh, deliver the work that we do in our businesses, they're always going to change. And, and the reason why we're talking today is because change has accelerated. It will continue to accelerate. Um, and um, But we need to be able to provide the vehicles that allow our people to know that it's comfortable, that it is okay to experiment, it is okay to learn, it is okay uh, to change the way that you're doing work today because our customers have changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we're, we're literally running out of time. Um, I just want to ask answer one question and then we'll have to wrap up. Um, from a student who's just beginning his DevOps journey, um, he's done some learning on his own and has learned how to utilize some of the tools. How does he go about getting hands-on projects or mentorship that he can learn and improve by doing? Because we talked about learning by doing earlier on. So, so first of all, absolutely brilliant, um, doing exactly the right thing. Um, I would say that uh, I would get in, um, involved with an open source project. Um, uh, open source is, is really um, a great way um, to... Um, uh, experiment with all the different uh, pipeline tools um, and it also looks fantastic on your uh, CV or resume uh, to say that you worked on an open source project such as uh, Kubernetes. Um, you can join today. Uh, you, there is no cost. Um, and that would be one thing to do. And then the second thing I would do is uh, there are uh, a lot of um, places like, uh, I will use an example here, uh, Fiverr, where you can find uh, projects that are small projects that companies are looking for individuals to help contribute to. Um, so, you know, tell them you've got experience with uh, uh, these tools um, and look for jobs where they're looking for people with those tools. I mean, there's a, a lot of uh, demand out there, and I think that demand will just continue to grow. So uh, you're doing all the right things. Those, are, those would be the directions I would go today. Wonderful. Great. Um, well, Dimitri, do you want to say anything before we uh, round off this? Yeah, event? I would like to thank the audience. I mean, uh, for their contributions, questions, we were not able to capture all of them, but you know where to find Matt, myself and Katrina. So uh, I'd like to thank all of them for uh, for this active participation. So yes. pleasure. Well, yeah. well it's, been, it's been a great discussion. There's lots that you can talk about on this particular subject. And if you would like to learn more about um, DASA as an organization, go to www.devopsagileskills.org. And uh, we will be doing these monthly sessions again, uh, where we do uh, encourage a interactive um, conversation like we've had today and you know, by learning from others basically. So, Dimitri, Matthew, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you to the audience for asking so many great questions. And that's all we've got time for. <laughs> Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Dimitri. Excellent. Thanks, so, man. Thank, thank you, Katrina. Thank Thanks, everyone. Okay. Right.